Thank you all again. Appreciate that, worship team. Uh, a usual quick reminder that if you have something you want us to pray about, uh, and you want to let us know, you can send us an email to prayers at westwoodchurch.net, or there should be a physical prayer request card there you can fill out and put in one of those silver bowls. And also, there should always be an elder waiting to pray for you, if you wish, in our prayer room off to the left. So, <clears throat> over the course of uh, my years getting to work in youth ministry, which was like 15 or 20 years, um, I had the chance to take lots of trips with students and leaders to go different places, uh, different times of the year. And over the course of those years, uh, I'd say probably 12 to 15 of those were on buses to go on a ski trip to Colorado. And uh, so in case you're not familiar, let me just share, share with you how these trips work. So what we want to do is get to Colorado uh, in the early afternoon so we can settle into where we're staying, hopefully have some programming and a meal that night and be ready to go skiing right away the next morning. You know, you got to get fitted, you got to get rentals, you got to get lessons, all that stuff. So we leave super early, like before dark 30. So usually we set a time to meet here in the parking lot at like 3 or 4, which means inevitably somebody sleeps through their alarm or forgets to set an alarm. So we're scrambling to call and, and see if somebody can go to their house and wake them up or whatever. But finally, everybody's there. All the stuff is there. We've taken roll. Everyone's good to go. And we head out. We, we cruise down I-80. And because of all that, early morning, inevitable drama, about 30 minutes in, the whole bus is quiet. Everyone's out cold. And uh, so that's what happened, actually. So back in 2019, the last time I think we took a trip, uh, we partnered with Youth for Christ to do that. Uh, uh, I was there. I was kind of helping near the front of the bus to help be a liaison between the driver and the rest of the bus. And so we all just kind of conked out. And I don't know how many hours later, probably a couple, I woke up, uh, and this is what I saw. Now, I don't know if you can quite see here. Uh, now, you're going on a ski trip, so snow is the idea. You just want it there, not on your way. But it does happen on a regular basis, and this is a pretty good storm. You, you can see the road. You can't really see the lines, but you can see there's like a path, and we're cooking pretty good, I, I assume, at a safe speed. I don't drive buses. Um, but, but you can see like there's not much margin for error. The other lane's completely snow-packed. The shoulder is snow-packed. It's white everywhere. So I woke up, and, and I mean, you might not be surprised. I was a little concerned. And I'm sitting at the front of the bus, and there's like a little handle there, so I'm kind of like gripping the handle, like just totally intensely staring at the road. And then it occurs to me, it's like, all right, man, you don't have a lot of options. I mean, on the one hand, you can sit here and chirp in the bus driver's ear, be a backseat driver, do more harm than good. You can insist, like, you know, we take an exit, and things will probably get worse. We can turn around and go home. That's probably not needed. Uh, or you just sit, sit down, <laughs> relax, close your eyes, maybe go back to sleep. So I thought, well, that's what I'll do. But believe it or not, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> Shut my eyes a few minutes later, I'm, I'm, I'm awake again. And, and, and I share that with you because I think that's kind of illustrative of the way that worry works in our life. I mean, nobody has to tell us worry doesn't do much good. But being able to turn it off, well, that's a different story. And that's why we're talking during this series, Formed in Freedom, how we actually can grow and, and actually be transformed through an ongoing connection to the living Jesus, through a handful of practices that can position us in a way that we are shaped and formed and molded. And as we did last week, this week we're going to begin with Jesus and his teaching about worry, believing he is uniquely qualified through his identity as God's unique son, the embodiment of all of God's love and goodness, and his character. He's proven his love for us by laying his life down. He wants our best. So because we believe he is uniquely qualified to speak to these matters, we're going to begin with what he said about worry, and go from there. So we're going to read a portion of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. It's found on page 737 in the Bibles under your chairs, in case you want to look that up. As always, we'll have words on the screen as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and read that. So would you stand with me as we always read? I uh, always stand when we read God's Word to engage our bodies, remind us of its authority in our lives. Starting in chapter 6, verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food in your body, more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. 
Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own, its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. My friends, this is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. God, we do give you thanks for your word. And as always, we would ask that we would be yielded to it and to your spirit's ongoing power and work in our lives today through this word. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to do briefly is, is just define worry. I want to clear up a little bit of confusion about what worry is and what worry isn't. Living free from worry is not the same as being careless to not care about those around us or what maybe goes on in the world or in our lives. What follows is that's actually not carelessness in terms of planning and preparing the best we can. Based on what we can expect will likely happen or maybe what could happen and we can prepare for. Further, living free of worry is not the same as just saying, oh, I don't worry about that stuff and then just abandon our responsibilities the things that are required of us, the things that we agree to do, the things that are right and good to do. To do what we say we will do or what needs to be done when we say we will do it and needs to be done is an act of love. And of course, sometimes we fail and we acknowledge that. We make good, we try to make it right. But none of that is the same as living free from worry. So what worry is, I really like the way that the author James Bryan Smith puts it in his book, The Good and Beautiful Life. He says this, he says, Worry is what we do after we've planned, prepared, and acted properly. When we continue to stew about something after all that, that's when we've crossed into the world of worry. Now, the problem with worry, in case it's not immediately apparent, is this. It can actually take over our lives. It can begin to dominate every corner of our being, every relationship. And when it does that, it automatically destroys joy in our lives. Joy is one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit that God intends us to experience as we keep step with the Spirit. And joy and worry are actually opposites because their focuses are completely contrary to one another. They're like oil and water. You see, joy is described as an overwhelming sense of well-being when we recognize our lives are in God's kingdom so they are safe and secure and we are under his watchful care. And worry, on the other hand, is an endless obsession of all that could go wrong and all that might happen and all that may... It's endless, and it's an opposite direction, and so it steals our joy. So that brings us to the next question of how do we deal with worry? Well, kind of like we talked about last week, I think the first step is a shift in perspective, a different kind of belief, and that's actually what Jesus is getting at when he gets to the heart of the matter in the Sermon on the Mount. If I were to give you just a quick summary of what we read a moment ago all the talk about wildflowers and birds and all the rest, Jesus is revealing to us who God is, and he essentially says, listen, God is not distant. God is near. God is not aloof, disinterested. God is very attentive. And God is not neutral. God cares. God is good. God loves you fiercely. That summary of God being near God being attentive, God being good, are all a pretty good summary of the God Jesus knows and loves that Jesus reveals to us and that Jesus invites us to know and love as well. That's why he said later on that we should seek God's kingdom above all else because when we seek God's kingdom first, that means we're going to continually look to God, take notice of and be, be focused on what it is he's doing in our midst and in the world. And we begin to make God's priorities our priorities. And when all that happens, our focus necessarily shifts away from worry and on to God's care and action in our lives. So the next step is, how do we do that? If you can't just shut your eyes and go to sleep when you're driving down a snowy road in a bus, how do you enter more fully into a life free from worry with that shift of perspective taking root in life? Well, actually the Bible does give us a pretty clear I don't want to be oversimplistic, but a pr pretty clear instruction on that, and that is to enter more deeply into a life of prayer. The writer Paul in uh, Philippians 4 famously said this. He said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. 
Now, I want to pause here and say, I, I don't think this is supposed to be some sort of browbeating command. Like, stop worrying, just get your act together. I, I really have come to view this more as an invitation. It's like, don't worry about anything. There's another option. Instead, pray about all things. Then he goes on to say, tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can do that today, how we can actually enter a deeper life of prayer. But before we do that, I want to just say a couple quick things. First, I think I, I just kind of assume and acknowledge that many of us have lots of guilt about our lives of prayer or maybe our lack of a profound, deep, consistent prayer life. And I want to ask you, just, it, it, just set that aside this morning. I, want, I don't want you to hear what I'm about to share with you as a whole list of things that you should do, and again, be like this browbeating thing where this is what you really ought to do, and if you're not, you're not living that. I, I want you to, to really receive what I'm going to share with you more as this is what could be. This is how you actually could take the other option instead of worrying about everything. And the other thing I would say about that is, uh, if you feel like you're still a beginner and learner in prayer, I think you're in good company. The disciples who became the apostles who wrote most of our New Testament came to Jesus and asked him how they might learn to pray. Presumably, they found his life of prayer a compelling thing, something that they wanted more of, and yet I think that they always saw themselves as learners and beginners even many years down the road. And I think that's probably okay if we see ourselves the same way. So what I want to share with you are just a few suggestions and then two practices that may help you enter into a deeper life of prayer. First, a few suggestions. Number one, I would say this. This may seem obvious, but if you want a deeper life of prayer, carve out a time and a place. Carve out a time and a place because these things often or usually even don't happen on accident. So whenever that may be for you, when you can have a consistent time, and maybe it's in the morning, maybe it's middle of the day, you have a natural break. Maybe it's at the end of the day. Uh, whatever it is for you, carve out a time and a place. And make it five or ten minutes-ish. Uh, you may notice, if you follow, if you uh, read the stories of the Gospels, many times Jesus does exactly this. Sometimes the crowds are pressing in upon him. Sometimes it's been a busy stretch and he knows he needs to get away and spend a deeper time of prayer with the Father. And so he does that. He gets away, often to a place of silence and a place of solitude, often with a view. And in that place, he more deeply prays and grows closer with his Father in heaven. The next thing I'd suggest is this, that you start small, both in terms of time and topics. So I mentioned already, I'd encourage you to set aside like five or ten minutes, but actually cap it at that. If you need to set an alarm, set an alarm. When the alarm goes off, you're done with that time of focused prayer. You're on to other things. You can continue to keep an open heart of prayer. There's no need that that needs to stop. But you go on to do what else, whatever else you are going to do. Because if you don't, here's what I think happens sometimes. We set these lofty expectations and burden ourselves down with these expectations where we need to spend 30 minutes, an hour a day in prayer. And if we don't, well, it's not really worth doing it at all then. That turns into a trap pretty quickly. So I'd encourage you to start small, five or ten minutes. And also start small with your topics. If you have things that you really think that you should be praying about, and you start there, and before you know it, your mind and heart is drifting towards something else, it's okay. Start there. Whatever's on your mind, pray about that. And then, sure, go to the other things that perhaps are even deeper convictions and priorities for you, and begin to pray about those things as well. The third thing I'd suggest is this. Find a way to make prayer a tactile experience. Let's be honest. For many of us, the reason it's difficult to cultivate a deeper life of prayer is because it's hard to have a conversation with an invisible prayer partner or an invisible conversation partner. Uh, and so one of the ways that we can help make that a more tactile experience is through a couple of practices that I want to share with you. One kind of on the individual level, one on the family or household level. First practice I'd consider, I'd ask you to consider trying is this. Uh, consider uh, having a prayer journal. Now, it doesn't need to be like a leather-ish, Christianized version like this one that I've used for a while. Uh, in fact, you'll be happy to know I did a little bit of research for you. I went to walmart.com. You can find a 70-page spiral-bound notebook, even today in these prices, 35 cents. You can find a seam-bound 100-page composition book, 50 cents. So no matter who you are, you can grab one of those, and it doesn't need to be anything fancy. 
And what I'd encourage you to do is to consider during that maybe five or ten minute time to just write down your thoughts, your concerns, your prayers. And the reason that I encourage you to do this, there's a couple reasons. First, having a prayer journal like that helps you more clearly articulate what otherwise seems sort of vague and swirling around, or even words spoken out loud and then it instantly vanish. They're, they're more articulate and they're, they're, they're more lasting as you write them down. But the second reason I'd encourage you to do that is because after you do this for a time, you have like a written track record. And by the way, I wouldn't, you don't need to journal every day. Consider doing a prayer journal five to ten minutes, like two or three times a week. Give it a month. And then just look back and see what you see. See, over the course of time, this practice can create a written track record of what we think we'll never forget, but we do. Prayers that we've offered, ways that God has answered prayer directly or brought about his own goodness in his own timing in ways we never would have guessed, but now we see why, maybe even just as through a glass dimly, why that actually is good and right. And, and again, what this helps us to do is over the course of the long term, we see God's faithfulness in print through the written track record that we've created and through what we have experienced. Helps us remember what we think we'll never forget. So that's one practice. The second one I would encourage you to consider is this. I would, consider, I would uh, encourage you to consider reusing your Christmas cards in a particular way. Now, I know some of you are very sentimental. You love your Christmas cards very much. Matter of fact, our former senior pastor, Scott Christensen, was like this. That's why whenever he'd get a card from the staff, he'd walk over to us and say, do you really think I need a picture of your kids? I see them three times a week. I know what they look like. He was very sentimental like that, as many of you know. Actually, he's more of a softie than he liked to let on. That came out more in the last few weeks and months before his retirement. But. but maybe you are. Maybe you really are sentimental about your Christmas cards and you're wondering what to do with them after the season. Well, I want to share with you a practice that our family was introduced to quite a few years back and we've done several times. And that is this. Uh, take those Christmas cards, cut out the pictures, and then bind them together somehow through a rubber band or maybe punch a hole in the corner, put a ring in it, and then put that somewhere where you and your family or your household often are. So here's a picture of that in our house a few years ago. Uh, we did that on our dining room table. We bound them together, and we just set them on a basket. So when we would come for a meal, we'd pray together, we would have a tactile way to pray for the people in our lives. The people who are near to us, who care about us, or at least enough to give us a Christmas card. That means something. And we pray for that family. Now, I share with you this picture, and actually I snapped this picture for a, a particular reason. From a distance, I don't know if you can see, but you may recognize the family in that picture from around here. Uh, that's the Turpin family, or at least the four kids of Blake and Amy. And I took this picture because of this story I want to share with you. You may remember uh, back in 2018, Blake and Amy's oldest daughter, Sarah, was playing soccer and got a soccer ball kicked at close distance really hard and hit her right in the side of the head. And in that instance, she lost sight in one of her eyes. And as you might expect, the days ahead of that were filled with all kinds of, of appointments and trying to see various specialists and eye doctors and other kind of doctors. And a lot of people had been praying for them, of course. Well, about a week and a half after that incident, uh, they had just found out shortly before then that, that she had uh, functional vision loss. They, they thought from what they could tell, her eye functioned fine, but she wasn't able to use it. And so about a week and a half after that, it just happened that as we sat down to prayer and sat down for a meal, it was the Turpins who came up. So we prayed for them. And of course, we prayed for Sarah. And then went about our meal, went about our business. But we found out later that that very day, probably within moments of us praying for Sarah, through a series of kind of providential events and connections, she was able to get to a particular uh, optometrist who did this crazy set of tricks that tricked her brain into releasing like the self-defense grip it had on her eye and proved that her eye did in fact work. And that from there, uh, it was just going to be a slow but steady process of her brain allowing her eye to work, and that's what has happened. It's an amazing story of just God's providential care in our lives using prayer. Uh, and, and this is one story. I, I have, it's amazing how often things like this happen. I can think of times when in just quiet prayer and openness to God, I've had a friend I haven't maybe talked to in months, heavily impressed on my heart. I, I couldn't not think about them, so I'd pray for them and then move along. Maybe I drop them a note later, and several times, many times, I find out later that very moment, that season, 
They were going through an excruciatingly difficult time, and those prayers, that note of encouragement was what lifted them through and helped them to make it. Again, I share that with you because it's amazing how often that happens on the one hand. But on the other hand, for me anyway, stories like that almost bring up more questions than they answer. Really, so God answers this prayer or does this uh, sort of prompting for you to pray for somebody to intervene in this situation when he left that one go? When he didn't heal that person? When he didn't stop that tragedy from happening? What? That, that doesn't even make any sense. For me, anyway, it brings up as many questions as it answers. But to bring the matter back to how it is that a deeper life of prayer like this can actually help us live free from worry, let me say this as the band comes forward to lead us in one final song. See, sometimes people get kind of caught up in, in the endless debate about what does prayer really do? Does prayer change us or does prayer change things? Well, the more I walk in discipleship to Jesus, wrestle with the scriptures and live that out every day, uh, what I find is I'm, I'm just convinced it's this mysterious blending of both of those things. Prayer does change us in our perspective. Prayer does change things, but there's no formula to it. And either way, in that mysterious way that God works to change us and change things in a deeper life of prayer, regardless of how, when we pray more deeply and experience God's kingdom and care, our focus is automatically shifted towards that, which immediately, automatically pushes worry to the margin of life instead of the front and center dominating of life. You see, we draw our comfort, not from our ability, supposedly, to be able to manage every situation, determine every outcome. That was always ever an illusion anyway. That wasn't true. But instead, what happens is our, we recognize our comfort is not drawn from our ability to control that, even from some miraculous ability to remove the possibility of any bad thing happening. But instead, it reminds us that in all ways, in all things, our lives have been placed in the capable care of our loving God through Jesus Christ. That's where our comfort comes. And to that end, what I'd like to invite you to do this morning is instead of praying as we close our message and bridge into a, uh, one more song together, I want to invite you to stand right now as we say responsively this question and answer one from the age-old Heidelberg Catechism that captures the summary of God's promises from Scripture on this very point. Very well. So I'll read the question. Together we'll read the answer. It says this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Join me. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him.